Hey there, Slashaholics. Before we start tonight, I want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons, because without these patrons, this channel would simply not exist. So thank you, Serpentrope, Mr. D. Arthur, Katie Sabo, Yusuf McRae, EXC3LS10R84, Chris Dozier, Cinerenix Cax, Alvaro M., Peyton Loeb, Jason Epstein, Marshall Jenkins, Jordan Nicholson, Landon Turner, Jackson Smith, EGSCW, Donovan Shelton, Kodo Bukia, Transformers, Morgan Cherney, Callie Gamer Girl 82, Michael Clark, Scar, The Jersey Devil, Nick, Gucci Solo, Jeremy Wilson, Jacob Hill, Nick Velcarve, Alex Vanover, Jay Gardner, William Schaefer, Liam Anderson, Iron Elixir, KC Hawaii, Catherine McClear, and Carl of Cthulhu. Thank you all so much. We really could not do this without you. And if anybody listening would like to help support the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come, please consider joining our Patreon or making a donation to the channel through PayPal, Cash App, or by ordering a Cameo video. All the information and links to do any of these is in the description and pinned comment below. I really hope you enjoy tonight's narration. Celestial Slumber, A Nightmare on Elm Street Story Written by Joshua LaRue Chapter 9, One-Way Ticket The last thing Barissa remembered was running from the diner. But now she stood on a street facing a house. A storm was hammering her with rain. Lightning struck across the sky and thunder roared. In front of her, an old earth mailbox was inches from where she stood. It had faded numbers hard to read in the rain, followed by the words Elm Street, and the Johnsons was written in black letters underneath. She heard a loud creak over the storm and glanced at the house and saw the door slowly open. She saw Alice standing in the threshold of the door, motioning her forward. Farissa took a deep breath and began walking up a small concrete path that led from the road to the front door of the home. As Verissa entered the home, she stood in a beautiful, fully furnished 20th century living room. To her left, she saw a light come on in a quaint dining room. Alice was nowhere to be seen now. With a bit of hesitance, Verissa walked to the dining room and ran her fingers on top of a solid oak kitchen table. As she walked the length of the table, her fingers slid against a small stack of papers and envelopes. She lifted them. The envelopes were either addressed to Alice Johnson or Dennis Johnson. As she flipped through the stack, she came upon three plane tickets. She read them. They were all three one-way tickets to Florence, Italy. The first one was for Alice Johnson. The second ticket was for Dennis Johnson. And the third was for Jacob Jordan. The tickets being for Italy made something stir in Verissa's mind. Her attention was then drawn back to the living room when a small lamp on a glass top end table next to a couch lit up. Verissa laid the envelope and plane tickets back on the table and slowly walked to the end table. The only thing on the small end table was a framed picture of Alice and a handsome man with a similar olive complexion to Verissa. She lifted the picture to take a better look. They were dressed in wedding attire. The two were in an embrace, their arms wrapped around each other, and were kissing. Barissa heard a rustling to her side and glanced over. From her studies of Earth One, she knew the item she was seeing was a newspaper. It was open on a coffee table placed in front of the couch. 
she turned and stood over the newspaper. She reached down and held it up in front of her eyes and read. It was an engagement announcement dated July 1992. It was written in Italian. Due to her heritage and studies of Old Earth, she was able to speak and read Italian and several other old and still used languages. The paper read, Alessandro Dante de Gennaro and Alice Elizabeth Johnson announced their engagement. Verissa's heart felt like it skipped a beat as her eyes fell on the last name de Gennaro. She was going to keep reading, but was interrupted by a voice behind her. It took a long time to move on after Dan. He was my high school love and much more. He was also the biological father of my son Jacob. We had a bond most other teenagers didn't have. We had both fought and survived Freddy Krueger. But I lost Dan when Freddy came back to finish the job. When I moved my father and son to Italy with me to escape all the pain and memories of Springwood, the distance helped me heal, and I met a wonderful man a couple years later. He was smart, funny, and treated my son and I so well. Alessandro de Janeiro was his name. We were married for the rest of our lives. We had one more child, a girl, Lisa. Jacob loved Alessandro, and Alessandro adored Jacob. He officially adopted him, and Jacob took his surname. Lisa didn't have any children of her own, but Jacob had four, and his four collectively had eight, and the de Janeiro name continued even after Earth-1 was evacuated, Alice explained. You mean? Verissa asked. Yes, we are connected by blood, Alice answered. The odds, though, how... how is this even possible? Verissa was perplexed. Fate, destiny... I have asked myself so many times why certain things happen to me, but there is never a good enough answer. They just happen, and they make us who we are. Your familial connection to me is how I was able to try to warn you about Freddy, about the danger ahead. My powers get weaker the more time that passes, but I projected everything I had, Alice continued. I tried to fully enter your dream to tell you and your crew to turn around before it was too late. I knew Freddy had his sights on you, all of you, and he was finally powerful enough to set his trap successfully. But he somehow intervened, twisted my warning to you, and you ended up in a nightmare, chased by the red and green snakes. I am sorry, Verissa. I'm sorry I wasn't able to warn you before it was too late. Verissa was speechless. It was an overwhelming feeling. Then she found her voice. You tried. That's all that matters. But the fact is, he is back. I don't know how long I have been asleep, but my crewmates and I are supposed to be in our sleep chambers for four days. That's a long time when a supernatural killer is after us. We're sitting ducks. Are my friends okay? I'm sorry, Verissa. Yes, he is coming after all of you. And even though he hasn't made an actual attack on you yet, sadly he has already claimed two of your friends, and another one of your friends barely escaped him, for now. But he won't stop until you are all dead, Alice answered solemnly. Oh God, he killed two of my friends? Who? Verissa asked, dreading the answer. I'm sorry, I don't know. I can just feel that two of your friends that entered Freddy's dreamscape have been claimed by him. You are my priority. You may be the only chance your world has at defeating him. So I have been keeping my eye on you and waiting for my chance to fill you in on how to stop him. But he has been hot on your heels. He has been toying with you so far. But you can be sure he plans to strike. Alice warned. I don't understand why this is happening to us. How do I stop him? How can I help my friends? Uh, how long have we been here? How long have we been asleep? Verista asked, trying to sound calmer than she felt. Time flows differently in this dreamscape, Verissa. I can't tell you how long you've been asleep. By now it could have been three days or three hours. Running will not work in the end. 
And the best thing you can do for you and your friends is, until you wake up, you are going to have to take the fight to Freddy. You can't wait for him to come to you. By then it could be too late, Alice added. How am I supposed to fight a supernatural dream demon? Varissa questioned. I have existed in the dreamscape for centuries, waiting for the day Freddy returned to power, always staying one step ahead of him. I died a long time ago. My spirit has been a watcher here, a guardian in his dreamscape. I still have some power and I could have passed it on to anyone if given the chance, but it won't meet its full potential until I pass it on to a living heir. Alice explained. When I was alive, Freddy came for me and my friends twice. The first time I learned of dream powers, what I was capable of here in this reality, and what others had been capable of before me. A girl named Kristen had joined together with the group of her friends and fought Freddy, tapping into individual powers. They were the dream warriors and they defeated Freddy for a time. But he is like a roach, Verissa. Somehow he always survives to kill again. Kristen was a wielder of the Dream Warrior power, and in her dying moments passed on to me the ability to harness that power, and I became a Dream Master. I was able to use the Dream powers, but even then Freddy was still able to kill several of my close friends, and even my brother. But I learned to harness the Dream powers of my fallen friends. They are powers that you can harness, Farissa. Powers that you will need to harness if you are to save yourself or your friends. If you harness the powers, you will be able to pull your friends into your dream. You and your friends need to remember, Freddy may have unlimited power in this dreamscape, but so do you. You can be whatever you want in your dream. Listen. Freddy is going to pick you and your friends off one by one unless you unite and stand against him. There's so much I need to tell you and we don't have much time. He knows I've been trying to reach you. I... I... Why is he doing this? My friends have nothing to do with what happened to him. Rarissa interjected. It doesn't matter. Freddy is eternal and eternally evil. It stopped being about revenge a long time ago for him. I hoped he would just sit on earth forever in his limbo and pout. He tried many times to trick others like you and your friends into falling for his trap to help him escape isolation, but he was never powerful enough or close enough to pull it off. I fear my presence in this dreamscape and my connection to you, me trying to warn you may have been the boost he needed to pull off his escape plan. But the why and what's don't matter anymore. It's time to listen, Verissa. I am going to pass on to you something that- Alice was cut off by a warbling noise that reverberated the walls and floor the women stood on. Large cracks broke horizontally on the walls around them. The ceiling above them broke open and flew away, and the walls around them crumbled to dust, and they found themselves standing in a dim, hot boiler room. Alice and Verissa stood back to back, spinning in circles, looking all around them. He's here, Alice shouted. You don't say, old friend, Freddy snorted. They looked up and saw Freddy jumping from a platform above them. He landed easily five feet in front of them. They all stood on a metal grated floor. Rows of pipes ran along their sides, and behind Freddy, a hot furnace burned, the fire inside of it casting an eerie light in the dark, dark boiler room. Why didn't you invite me to the family reunion, Alice? Freddy laughed. Oh well, I knew this one was special when I saw you were trying to get her attention. It was too easy to let you do all the work and lead me to her. I just sat back and waited for my moment, and now you've given it to me. Two bitches with one stone. Go to hell, Kruger. It's too late. 
You waited too long. She knows everything now. Alice shouted defiantly back at Freddy. Oh, I'm shaking in my boots, bitch. No, hell wasn't my style. I think I'll stay right here. Your little descendant and her friends have given me a new lease on life. And now that they have pulled up all my information on their ship, it'll all be part of a record. The name Freddy Krueger will strike fear again, and I will get back to doing what I do best. And I'll have a whole new planet with a lot of new Elm Streets to visit, he growled. One problem, Kruger. Alice stepped back. Oh yeah? What's that? He asked sarcastically. We won't let you live long enough to hurt anyone else, Alice said with a fire in her eyes. Alice knew the biggest mistake she could make was giving Freddy time to talk and distract. She didn't wait. She jumped into the air inhumanly high and flew down at Freddy. Her leg extended and connected with his chest, knocking him down. Verissa was awestruck at what she was witnessing. Alice ran to Kruger's side and reached to pick him up, but Freddy was fast. He lashed out with his glove and sliced her across her forearm. He sprang to his feet effortlessly and grabbed hold of Alice. Verissa ran to assist and tried to get Freddy in a headlock, but Freddy knew she was there and backhanded Verissa, knocking her to the ground. Her nose began dripping blood. She wiped it away and recoiled and slowly got back to her feet, silently rooting for Alice to defeat the child killer. Freddy grabbed Alice by the back of the head and began trying to move her towards the furnace. Alice threw her feet out in front of her and pushed off the front of the furnace, knocking Freddy to the ground and landing on top of him. She threw her elbow backwards, connecting with Freddy's face, and Alice copied Freddy's earlier move, and with the grace of a cat, she sprang to her feet. Alice threw her hands out towards Freddy's prone form, and lightning bolts shot forth, striking Freddy, sending him sliding several feet on his back. He began to pull himself up, and Alice reached back into her past and thought of her brother. And, and as Freddy shakily stood to his feet, Alice harnessed his martial arts prowess and jumped and spun, connecting with the roundhouse kick, slamming Freddy back against the opening of the furnace. Freddy swung his gloved hand at Alice, and she sidestepped his attack, gripping his wrist in both hands and flipping him onto his back, using his own momentum. Alice lifted her leg and brought her foot down hard onto Freddy's head. Verissa smiled and let out a cheer of, Yes! Freddy held his face, and Alice did not hesitate. She picked Freddy up off the ground, and with the strength that shocked Verissa, Alice held him over her head and threw him against the row of pipes on their right side. Freddy hit the pipe so hard, it broke a large one, and steam hissed out, spraying Freddy in his face. He covered his face with his hands and howled in pain. He staggered back in front of the women, his back inches from the open furnace. Alice saw her shot, a chance to end this here and now, or at the very least give Verissa more time to receive the powers and learn how to use them. Alice backed up leapt back into the air and extended her leg to kick Freddy again. This time, her intent was to knock the dream demon into the open furnace. As Verissa watched, her look of wonder at Alice's ability was suddenly replaced with one of abject terror, as she saw what was going to happen. As Alice began her descent to connect with another kick, Verissa looked at Freddy. Time seemed to slow down. She saw Freddy lower his hand away from his face. His scowl of pain from the hot steam was now gone, replaced by an insidious grin. She felt like she was going to be sick as Freddy locked eyes with Verissa and winked. He then returned his focus to Alice, and before her foot could connect with his chest, Freddy reached out with both hands, grabbing Alice by the ankle. He gripped her ankle tight and spun to the side, using her own momentum against her, letting go of her ankle as he guided her directly 
into the furnace. Feeling a little deja vu, Alice? Freddy cackled, looking into the furnace. Well, that argument got a little heated, huh? Freddy said, turning to Verissa. No, Alice! Verissa screamed, wanting to run to the furnace, but fearing the undead dream killer that stood in her way. She had no choice but to watch as Alice's soul burned in the furnace before her. Tisk, 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 Verissa. You mean girls gossiping behind my back. That's just rude. But hey, now anything you want to say, you can say to my face. Freddy began, but before he could finish his sentence, Alice's burning being sprang from the opening of the furnace and reached out towards Verissa. A round orb of bright white energy shot out from Alice's hand and flew through the boiler room, casting the room in such a bright light that Freddy had to lift his arms in front of his face to block the blinding light. The orb struck Verissa in the chest, and a white energy ran an outline around her body and then seemed to pull itself under her skin. Behind Kruger, Alice's burning soul began to rapidly decay, like a rotting corpse. But in her last effort to assist her descendant, she reached out her burning, decaying hand and grabbed hold of Freddy's shoulder and pulled him towards the opening of the furnace. Verissa didn't know how she knew, but in that moment, she knew what to do. Freddy had actual fear etch across his burnt face as he felt himself being pulled backwards towards the furnace. And as he saw Verissa standing confident a few feet in front of him, her eyes turning a solid white. She lifted her hands in front of her, pulled them back, and in a swift movement, thrust them forward, and a bright white stream of light burst from her hands and hit Kruger square in his chest. At the same time, Alice's soul crumbled to ash in the fire. Kruger swayed backwards, his body threatening to fall in the fire. He jerked his head towards Verissa, his yellow bloodshot eyes staring a hole of hate into her soul, the white energy pouring into him. I've got a play date with your friends. You're gonna pay. This isn't over, Freddy growled, and he disappeared before Verissa was able to use her newfound dream powers to fully push him backwards into the furnace. Verissa felt all of her energy drain from her, and the white stream of light disappeared, and she collapsed to one knee. The furnace's fire went out. What the hell just happened? She asked the empty room as she breathed hard trying to regain her energy. Alice's words echoed in her mind. If she harnessed the dream powers, she could bring her friends to her, and they could take the fight to Freddy. Talos stood at the control panel in the cryo chamber room in deep thought. The primary vital alarms were still sounding for Danella, Naquilio, and Butch, and had been for a very long time. How long exactly, Talos couldn't be sure. He had been otherwise distracted, hard at work trying to find a way to assist the crew. Luckily, so far, their vital alarms had not escalated to the point of being joined by the emergency level alarms. He needed to help them at all costs, but Kruger had somehow destroyed his program that allowed his AI system to interface with the neural implants of a crewmate. But there had to be some other way in, something he could use to bypass whatever it was Kruger had done to keep him out. Talos waved his hand over the control panel, and a screen appeared. He opened his index finger again, and a cord snaked out and connected to the panel, and data began scrolling on the screen. He tried something new, but was greeted by a flashing red and green screen with the words, 
fuck off R2 appearing on the screen. I don't know what that means, Talos said aloud as he began another attempt at using a backdoor channel to sneak back into the neural implant system of his crewmates. But before he could execute his idea, the emergency level vital alarms for Danella, Naquilio, and Butch all started blaring at the same time. Oh, what in the actual fuck? Talos blurted out loud, surprising even himself. Talos 16 turned his attention back to his screen and with unrivaled determination went back to work. Although now a new plan was growing in the android's mind. He would not only find a way to interface with the neural implant system again, but he would find a way to clone and upload his own programming into the subconsciousness of the entire crew all at once, so he could give them assistance and save all their lives. And time was of the essence, because Talos 16 now understood and was fully aware that Freddy was indeed turning up the heat. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 9 of Celestial Slumber, a Nightmare on Elm Street novel by yours truly, the 80 Slasher Librarian Josh LaRue. I had a lot of fun writing this chapter. Um, I knew that Alice uh, was going to be an ancestor of Varissa's, and that for centuries since the, the folks of Earth 1 had left to go to Earth 2, Freddy's had nothing but time, you know, to build up his powers to learn what he's really capable of. You know, to be able to interact with the living world even more than he has in the past. And, uh, you know, Alice stayed in the dreamscape behind. You know, and it makes me wonder if there's other times, you know, like, because uh, I even mentioned in the prologue, you know, there's times that Freddy came back after the events of things that we know about as fans. You know, it's humanity left Earth 1 about 250, 300 years before where we're at right now. Uh, but from the time that, you know, Freddy versus Jason, for instance, up until the point that Earth-1 people left, Freddy came back every now and then. So there's a ton of stories we could I could tell there. Um, but each time he did, Alice stayed in the dreamscape after she died, uh, you know, in her normal life, and uh, did everything she could to help uh, get Freddy defeated. And uh, it was really cool to, to write uh, her, you know, explaining... Um, her dream powers, getting to mention her brother, uh, you know, finding out what happened after Dream Master and Dream Child with her. Uh, she mentioned in the movies uh, visiting, you know, going to Europe and everything. So um, it was really cool for her to lay out the tickets uh, for Verissa to find uh, that said Italy. And, uh, you know, that got something stirred in Verissa since Verissa has an Ital uh, Italian heritage. And uh, then to find the picture of Alessandro and, and Alice at their wedding. And then the wedding announcement, De Janeiro. Um, you know, she, gave, she, she did have some mourning time after Dan passed. Uh, but she met somebody. That guy adopted Jacob. And uh, it went from there. And she stayed behind in the dreamscape. And now she has an heir to pass the powers on to. Which in my uh, canon makes the dream power stronger than just passing it on to another friend like Kristen did. Because uh, now the powers can, can meet their like full potential or something like that. She didn't exactly get a full chance to explain everything uh, to, Ver to Verissa, and that was by design. Uh, Verissa's going to have to figure some things out on her own now. Uh, but I enjoyed writing, you know, kind of the mirror image of what happened when Kristen gave her powers to uh, Alice. Uh, but this time the powers didn't pass through Freddy, and uh, you know I just I, it was a lot of fun. I didn't I never intended to keep Alice around for the whole story. It was always about passing the dream powers on to Verissa, and uh, you know Verissa you know pulling on the Dream Master Dream Warrior angle uh, to take the fight to Freddy later in the book. I don't want to give anything away, 
Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed the fight between Freddy and Alice. It wasn't a super long fight, but it wasn't a super short one either. And Alice did get some really good licks in. And, uh, you know, she got to dig into the past with the lightning bolts. And then uh, her brother's power, uh, her brother's martial arts abilities. Uh, at least Freddy was there and he wasn't invisible, you know, right? I get, I get some points for that, right? <laughs> um, but I thought it was very Freddy to... Um, cut, you know, pull his face, pull his hands down off his face, kind of wink at Verissa, and, uh, you know, she's like, shit, and then Alice gets thrown in, and, uh, of course, Freddy's sitting there running his mouth, deja vu, got a little heated, huh, um, anyways, had a lot of fun writing all that, but Verissa's got the powers now, uh, she doesn't know exactly how to use them, but when she saw Alice being, uh, her, Alice's soul being burnt, she tapped into him somehow, so maybe she'll figure something out like that going forward. And meanwhile, Talos is back at the Beowulf, trying to figure out another way in, and Freddy's still blocking him. And, uh, you know, Freddy's pissed right now. He's pissed at Talos for intervening. Maybe pissed at Talos for calling him ball sack head. I don't know. Uh, and he's also pissed that uh, Alice was able to get those powers to Verissa, and Verissa almost cleaned his clock. So while Talos is sitting there, you know, trying to find a back door or another way in, and now trying to find a way to access all of them at the same time. Um, Freddy is indeed turning up the heat, and he's going after three crew members at the exact same time. Uh, the next chapter is called is titled Blitz Kruger, and uh, like I said before, it is definitely a Blitzkrieg coming up in chapter ten. Uh, Freddy's after three crewmates at the same time: Butch, Naquilio, and Danella, and. Uh, he, he's really pissed, and uh, he's not going to pull any punches. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's chapter. Hope you're looking forward to the next one. Let me know what you thought of uh, Alice and Barissa, the fight in the boiler room, and what Freddy's up to now. Um, I can tell you this much, nobody in this story is safe. Uh, this isn't playing by the rules, you know. Um, Freddy, you saw it with Christina. She was built up as like a character that might have a bigger story. But when Freddy wants somebody dead, Freddy's going to get it done. Um, that isn't to say that some of these might, you know, be able to stop him for a time. But uh, just remember, nobody is safe in this story. And uh, I'll be back very soon with another chapter. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. Always remember the sun never sets on those who ride into it. And pleasant dreams! See you soon.